Hello and welcome to the Stories of Northern Life, a podcast brought to you by the Sault Ste. Marie Museum, sharing the heritage of Northern Ontario and the culturally rich stories in everyday life. We bring the events and people of the Sioux's past to a new light and capture the stories of changemakers in our Northern community today. Hello, Ryan. <laughs> Hi, Mira. <laughs> and welcome to the Stories of Northern Life podcast. I'm super excited to put you on the... <laughs> and... Doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, so I'm pretty excited to um, see your perspective on your life and as a journalist in the Sioux. So. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. Yeah. It's exciting to be here. Good, I'm glad. Okay, so let's start at the very beginning. Are you from the Sioux? I am. Yes. What was childhood like? Where did you live? Go to school? Just a generic picture of your upbringing here. The family home was at 29 Maluk Street. I went to St. Bernadette. I went to St. Mary's. Very good. <laughs> I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> what activities did you do growing up? Like extracurriculars or like hobbies, things that you enjoyed? Oh, I'm going to edit this right <laughs> I can. Okay, good. See, that's such a broad question. That's why I struggle with it. Yeah. I mean, I was terrible in sports. I took skating lessons but never learned how to stop. <laughs> I ran into the boards. So my dreams of being a defensive forward to Montreal Canadiens, you know, never happened. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't great in school. I was okay. But I could always write. So if we stick on that theme, I started to write. I remember sneaking paper out of Mrs. Larishal's cover drawer in grade two and I think I wrote a story but I don't have it so the earliest story I have is from grade three that's very cool it is cool and what did you write about oh you know I, I looked for it before I came down but I couldn't find oh, it because no. it was my detective story they were detective stories so it was like private eyes my classmates so there's about 10 people that I was in class with. it was it was always Mark Donnelly and Fernando Afonso they were the they were the main detectives so it was Mark Fernando Monica blank 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 okay. meet the claw there was a, a, I think it was a monster named the Claw, and he was going around killing people, I think, at schools. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so creative. That makes up for my not being very good at math and science. <laughs> I can write stories. That's awesome. So, what, so that was your creative outlet, writing, writing, and it started very, very young. Yeah, like I say, that, that's the earliest memories. Great yeah. I remember my dad would take me down to the main branch of the library. That was great on Saturdays to get books. I remember my mom sitting at the kitchen table reading the Sioux Star. Okay. So that stayed in my brain. I remember my mom sitting with me on the, on the sofa in the living room reading books. So there's all those different writing yeah, references writing. that were right there pretty much from the get-go. That's awesome. So you were at St. Mary's, and then, then what did you do? Post-secondary education to further this interest right so up writing. until grade 12 i was all set to become a teacher because okay. the teachers at st mary's college were so awesome i was going to i was all set on being a reporter newspaper reporter but i said you know the teachers at st mary's are so great if i became a teacher i like history i like english right but i could still do the yearbook i could do the school newspaper so instead of going for a straight journalism program well i started in english and then it became english history and i graduated with a history degree very cool from rock. From rock but i was involved with the newspaper the brock press all okay. The way so I was still doing that. And then it came time to graduate. And you think after all that time with the Brock Press, I'd say, well, you know, I should be, I, I should really be a reporter. No, I went off to teacher's college. I was at York. Okay. So the very campus there. Very cool. And I really didn't like the Brock, <laughs> the York experience after the great Brock experience. I taught for five years and I remember saying, you know, I got into teaching for the right reasons, but I'm not a great teacher. And the Timmins Daily Press, was looking for a reporter. I remember seeing the ad in the fall of 1998, and I said, I'm going to apply awesome. for that job. And I'm grateful to Dave McGee, the managing editor there, that he gave me a chance because I, didn't have, I don't have a journalism degree per se. Right. But I'm but sure he lots of me. references. And, and I went up to Timmins and worked for just under two years there. And I worked a lot of hours and didn't make much money, but I was incredibly grateful for the chance to do to learn the craft, it was a daily newspaper. Timmins is a really neat community. Yeah. And thanks to that, I was able to come back to the Sioux in 2000, the Sioux Star. Awesome. 
We jumped really, I jumped really wide ahead from that was childhood perfect. memories to uh, university experience and then getting into the field. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's perfect. That's exactly answered all my questions leading up. So you're good. <laughs> um, so your first journalistic job was in Timmins. Interesting. And then how did you get the job at the Sioux Star? Well, it became open. I yep. mean, that was always the and hope. Just, yep. The hope was to come back to Sioux St. Marie. Timmins is a wonderful training, awesome training ground, but you, it would be hard for the average reporter to make a career of it in Timmins just because it is long hours. It right. wasn't a lot of money. So it, it, it was basically, uh, if you want to think of the Greyhounds, like a training ground. Then you, you move up. Yep. I knew I wanted to come to the Sioux, and when the job became open, I applied, and fortunately I was hired. Because the next position didn't come open until 2004. Wow. So I wouldn't have been able to stay in Timmins for another four years. I would right. have gone somewhere else. And then you wonder Where? would I have been able to make it back. Right. Perfect. So if I can add, uh -huh. to come back to write for my hometown paper yep. is awesome. Great. That's very good. And I have to remind myself of that every once in a while because I forget. It's like, you're writing for your hometown paper. The paper that you read on the living room floor, you're now reporting very full circle. What pieces were you writing when you started your job? Timmins? No. Nah, yeah, sure. Go from Timmins. Well, and then I, that doesn't sound like the question you were going to ask. I was going to ask in the Sioux. What were your first pieces writing here? I don't remember. I work... Oh, the easiest way to answer it is my, my shift was Wednesday to Sunday. So okay. I was the weekend guy. So a lot of it was just things that were going on the weekend. So if there was fundraising walks, off I'd go. I don't know... Yeah. Was I entertainment? I was probably entertainment. <laughs> Maybe education at that point. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's, no. That... <laughs> I could have checked the archive. I mean, that, was, that was August 2000 that I started. Right. I remember my, I think my first story, at least the first day, there was an indigenous group. That, I think they were walking around Lake Superior. Okay. And they were having an event at Roberta Bonda Pavilion. So I remember that was literally... One of the first stories. Very cool. Because you got to go out there and actually experience it? Or was that no? Were you just reporting? Experience as in walking around Lake Spirit? Oh, no. No, no, no obviously. That was, that was right down the building. <laughs> but I went with Keith Stephen, the photographer, and I thought it was so cool. I said, wow, all these people know Keith. Well, of course, he'd been photographing for the paper for right. a fraction of years. And something else was nice about those early years that I'm really grateful for is with the weekends, at least, I was able to work with Margaret Cameron McQueen. Just an awesome photographer. She took your photograph in 2005. <laughs> yeah. She did. And I, I, when I saw it, I said, that's awesome that Mira got photographed by Margaret. Margaret taught me so much about photography. Yeah. And it was just a, a joy to see her photography. And I hope that some of her influence, that I remember some of what she did. Yep. So you have a close connection with all the photographers as you go through. Well, then there were full-time shooters because Bob Frost and Keith Stephen were the full-time shooters. Margaret was part-time. Rachel okay. Lebrecht came later. But unfortunately now, you, there's no just photographers. Right. Everybody is well, multimedia journalists. Is the, I see. It's the official job type. I see. So you do everything. So you're out there with a camera, notepad, yep. <laughs> I got a notepad <laughs> And a bunch of pens and pencils. <laughs> Very cool. So, yeah, so that's, she taught you a lot about photography then. Well, just by, I mean, it's not like she say, well, I probably asked her, but Margaret was so <laughs> awesome about posing people. If, and that's why I'm curious mm. to see, in our archive, I just see that she took your photo. Mm. I'd have to go through newspapers.com to see how she posed you. Margaret was a wonderful poser. I can't pose people. People see me, they just want to stop and look, hey! <laughs> I just like getting right. candid shots. I'll just right. walk around at an event till I see something just happening and you got a good lens on the camera so you can just yep. get a moment. Yep. I think that's special. That's special. Like that's a good way to capture moments because um, everyone poses, puts on a face and you don't, don't capture the like essence of the events. And that happened at the uh, Bonsu Olympics with the high school kids a few weeks ago. So there's uh, some guys from White Pines. Hey! Yeah. Take my photo. And they're like, eh. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to take your picture like that. Just, <laughs> right. just do something. And then they, they did kind of a cheer. And they're all bouncing around. They're not paying attention to me. I said, great. And that, that photo ran on front page. Perfect. That's awesome. So, <laughs> pro tip. <laughs> Don't pose for me. <laughs> just Pop be natural. Down. <laughs> do something, yeah. Do something. <laughs> I love that. That's, that's amazing. 
Um, so how has your job evolved, I guess? So that's one way. That When did you start taking photos alongside? Well, I, I started right from the start. But, okay. Okay. But that was some photography. And sometimes one of the shooters would come with me. Now I'm all the time. I mean, that's changed. Yeah. Social media, right? Yep. That wasn't around right. when I started. So. Right. Post on Twitter. If we ever get back with Facebook, we'll be back to yes. posting on Facebook. Right. Layout. Well, I did layout at the start, but when I started doing layout, there would be an editor. Okay. There would be two editors because they're doing the city pages and the sports pages. Well, now it's just me. So when I do the layout, it's just me. But everything's been centralized. Mm -hmm. So what used to be all done at the paper, yep. now if it's a wire page, so a national page, a business page, we've got our folks in Barry. Okay. So I would just say... Okay, I've got 12 pages. All right, we're going to have four local pages. I'm responsible for those. But Sports Wire, they just drop it in. I so that's see. Been a big, that's been a big change. That's a big change, definitely. Definitely. Um, so what does a typical day look like? How is it? Is there like a structure to your day? Hopefully I get the first two or three hours just to do stuff. Okay. Without any phone calls. So I try and get my briefs done. That's... What I did this morning, most of the morning, was doing briefs. I wrote about three or 400 words. Wow. Post those on the website. Plea court starts at 10, so you keep an ear on plea court. You can do that online now. Okay. I guess that's something else that's changed two ways. Yeah. That was as a result of the pandemic. Keep an ear on plea court is something you want to watch about. What press releases come in during the day? I mean, the city police, OPP, put out things. Those come in. You want to get them up on the website. Hopefully, you're going to get some interviews done. You like a short order cook. Right. Something comes in, you crank it out, up it goes. It's like if anybody watched MASH and they talk about meatball surgery, you know, it's, it's not fancy, but hopefully it's good <laughs> and it's quick. Right, right. So are you on call during the day or is it kind of like, yeah, like I don't, just, I don't know how it works. Do you have a structured hour set or are you on call like all 24 hours to like write things and report on... Big. So I guess technically, yes, yeah. but realistically, I mean, it have to be something pretty, pretty major, like the steel plant. If the steel plant hires or fires 500 people and they're announcing at 8 o'clock at night right. while you're back to reporting. Right. If there was a few years ago, there was a business up on McNabb Street, not far from where I live. It was on fire. Okay, well, I walked up and wow. got a shot because I heard it. <laughs> I had a scanner at that point. Of course, they, now they scramble the calls, so you can't hear. But I heard it on the fire scanner. Just happened to be awake at 2.30 in the morning when that call came in. I said, well, it's just up the street. Might as well. Yeah, off I went. That's so cool. They get the shot. Wow. Crazy. Does that... That definitely answers. Okay. Yeah, that definitely answers. I mean, question. officially, the shift is, starts for me at about 7.15. Okay. Hopefully, I'm done around 4. But that's, that's a pretty long day. Well, yeah. it's flexible because... If something comes in five minutes yeah. before your shift ends, you got to get it done. You got to do it. Yeah. That's, that must be hard sometimes, eh? <laughs> well, if you like a nine to five job and you know when you're going in and when you're going home, don't get into journalism. <laughs> Not about, for you. <laughs> there's, there's another line of work you want to pursue because that's just, I mean, that's the blessing and curse of the job. They said you get a front right. row seat to history, but sometimes they're very long days and Sometimes you'd really like to go eat something, but <laughs> you got to get the story done yeah. or at least get something posted on the website, eat, then go back and update it. So approximately how many articles go out a day by you? Uh, Is there like a range? Well, I guess it depends on the day. I mean, yeah. today, today I did the briefs. I just did the briefs in the morning. I did an interview. Northland Barbershop course has got their show coming up. Had lunch. I had my mentorship meeting. So today I haven't written any stories. I've done three or 400 words of briefs. But in an average day, I could see two or three stories. Okay. Maybe, again, oh, I did a mining story. <laughs> that was a small story. So it could be maybe around three stories a day. Okay. Three, three to 500 words. Yeah. I tend to write on the shorter side. Yeah. Court stories tend to be about three to 450. Nice. 
it's rare that you'll see me do anything over 600. It happens, but yeah. not too often. No, people like to read shorter, shorter bits these days. If you want shorter bits, I'm your guy. <laughs> Has there been a favorite like year or span of journalism that like you've covered that has sticks out to you? No. Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is we had the building up until 2020. So that's the quickest answer I could give you. I mean, to go to be in the newsroom was a great place to be. So that was 2000 to 2020. I miss being in the newsroom. Yeah. Some people may like working at home. I would rather work. It was like a club. Yes. It was a lot of fun. I mean, there's yes. a lot of stress too, and there could be some very heated arguments right. at times. But to be in the, in the newsroom and to have our library at the other end of the newsroom with, with our archive, all the clippings, all the photos, all the city directories, awesome. Yes. I have a question, pop over. Right. Peter Ricci at his desk, bemoaning the Detroit Tigers, whatever Detroit team was losing that day, and Jeffrey over at his computer with the <laughs> 70s music playing. <laughs> you know, just a fun place to be. There'd be a, 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 roar, a, a row of um, storage cabinets separating us from advertising, but you'd hear some of the jokes coming from the advertising right. folks. You'd crack up at them. That's. That was a more enjoyable part of the job. Definitely. Otherwise, I don't know. I mean, the stories just keep coming. The, right. the beats are still there. I've been covering entertainment for years, and that's, that's just a, a great thing. It's, it's rewarding to talk to veterans about their experiences. And yeah. Every day is a little slice of history, and I'm glad to be able to document it. Definitely. So what's, is there a favorite part of your job, you'd say? Is there something that you just love and that keeps you doing it? Well, every morning I'm excited to sit down in front of the computer. Yeah. You know, it's not like, oh, I got to work. <laughs> Why am I not off? I like what I do. I love what I do. So every day it's fun to do. It's fun when you type in somebody's name, if you're tracking a story yeah. and see. Is, am I telling you this? Was it Andrew Stewart's? Yes. Okay. Okay. Me. Yes. You know, somebody like Andrew Stewart. the first time I talked to him, grade three or grade four, mm -hmm. he's doing public speaking. I think it was at Sioux College. Talk to him there. And then Andrew gets involved in community theater. I talked to Andrew about community theater. Yep. So to be able to track somebody, track, well, that doesn't sound too good, but <laughs> just to follow, just Definitely. to follow somebody over the years, like, oh, and, and, and now having done it for almost 24 years, like Bob Shammy, when I was talking to Bob this morning from Northland Barbershop course, we were talking about his show in 2004. Well, I did that story. Wow. So it's neat to have that history and say, oh, yeah, I remember that. That's a very rewarding Part of the job definitely and now i don't remember what the question was <laughs> <laughs> your favorite part so that's it yeah but even and and then i mean there's so many things that give you a word it, when i'm doing layout which doesn't happen very often if you can build a nice looking page definitely. if you can get some solid artwork that to me is exciting it's like oh look at that photograph yeah yeah you just need one you know this is yeah. this is your background you get one good shot and you flank with stories to see that page come back like oh that's good i hope readers get a charge out of that that's the kind of things that excite reporters and the rest of us like, eh. but for us it's 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 yeah. a big thrill yeah i love that that's a great answer and every time the paper comes well when we had the press here because that you get the the quick turnaround right i mean what you work on the next day really is out. in the paper it's not something that you i don't know if you build a ship how many years does it take to build a ship for a building right I write a story the next day, well, the next, within the hour, it's on the website, and then we publish three days a week now, and it's in the paper. It's like, oh, great, there it is. Do you have a favorite story or an interview that you've had that, like, just sticks out that has either, like, made an impact on you personally or affected you in some way? <sighs> Don't have to answer. It's a, tough, it's a hard one. So. It is a hard one because, <laughs> I mean, it's been, you write maybe six to 800 yeah. stories a year plus the briefs, although there's not as much right. connection with the brief. So, no, I can't say, well, that's ultimately, I can tell you from a photo perspective. Okay. From a photo perspective, I definitely have shots that, it's like, oh, that was such a great, and they usually involve Bellevue Park. Okay. I think my favorite all-time photograph, there was two or three sisters it wasn't a swing. It was, it was around Gizmo. It's okay. still there, and you go. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. I don't know what it's called. But their expressions again—they're not 
posing for me. Right. But they were so happy. It's a vertical. Mm -hmm. I love vertical photographs because they're swinging. And when that and the editor, that was Frank Rubnick at that point, to his credit, I think he ran it two or three columns. It was a it was a good chunk of A1. But it was boring break. But it was a great <laughs> shot. It was a photo that you'd say, yeah, that deserves to have that right. space. So the photographs I get excited about. That I say, oh, those, there's definitely, I definitely think, oh, that's got to be top 10. That the one that happens is exciting. But for the stories, that's tougher because there's so yeah. many, so many people. I mean, within two minutes, you could be talking about somebody getting a serious surgery. I mean, who else does that? That right. you've just met somebody and you're asking them these incredibly intimate questions and they're sharing that information with, like, that's, a great responsibility that Definitely. people open up like and they're trusting you to get it right and yes do yeah. their story justice when you're talking two sides of an issue when you hear when you hear the other side it's like oh well okay i hadn't thought of that perspective before yes. so that's a neat part of the job or when you learn i mean you're always learning something new yeah it's like wow that's really cool yeah and then so in that sense yeah you do have an appreciation it's like I never thought about this subject, and now I know a little bit about it, and I think that's that's great. Yes. And it's frustrating when you don't, like, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating when you miss the chance to talk with somebody. When I see an obituary, mm. and somebody did something neat, and I say, I didn't get a chance to talk to that person. Right. That makes me unhappy. Yeah. There was just a gentleman, he helped start the uh, um, Run Gun Club, okay. or he brought it back okay. in about 51, 52. And then in 54, he helped start Sue Naturalist. Hmm. And he was up at Great Northern Retirement Home where my mom was. Don't think he was on the same floor, but I didn't know about him. Right. And then I read his obituary. I was like, oh, right. I wish I would have had a chance to talk to him for 20 minutes and what got him... What he remembers about starting those groups and what does he think? I mean, they're both, they're both still active all these, all these years later. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I think we need more people like you trying to capture these. But you're doing the same I'm thing. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm no, trying. You, you think it's just a story. But yes. You, but look at you. You're up to 100 now, right? Yeah. 100 so published, yeah. I write a story a day. Okay, well a story but if you're covering the same topic for 20 years <laughs> well then maybe you've got a few dozen or a couple hundred Definitely. stories on that person or that organization and that to me is a real reward yeah you can trace the history the ups and the downs what do you think the benefit of doing that is for well, i guess Sault Ste. Marie? there's a record yeah that if you're ever wondering about a specific event a specific specific address a specific person hopefully you're going to be able to look at the newspaper and that'll answer your questions yep because usually we write about things when they start and then we're covering it as it's going <laughs> along and then if they close yep. again it's the frustrating thing now that i mean it's very rare that people will I mean, nobody puts birth announcements in anymore. Right. And we only get a fraction of the obituaries. Yeah. And you, you don't see wedding announcements anymore and no. engagement. So I, I wonder that 100 years from now, if you want to track somebody, how easy is it going to be? If you're relying on Facebook, yes. is Facebook still going to be around? Is it going to morph into something else? If Facebook is still around, are you still going to be able to look at, hey, we just got married? Right. With the newspaper, I think the odds, I think I feel safe in saying this, you can still hopefully go to the library or online and it's there. Yes. Well, at least up until right. things moved online. That, right. Oh, there's a birth announcement. Oh, uh, that's where they, maybe we wrote about somebody when they were in school or when they were a sports team. Oh, they got married. There's the engagement announcement. Oh, there's a reference to where they worked. They died. Right. And it's all in the paper yep. at different points. Yeah. So I, I wonder about that. Yes. That's a big line. part of why I want to do this and, and talk to people from like kind of like the start of their lives to the end of their lives because I see in our collection that we're not getting a lot of donations um, coming in because they're not tangible. And if we have a tangible object, there's no story with it. Mm. If you look in our collection, any artifact 
most of our artifacts, there's a description of the physical, but there's no description of who it belonged to, maybe like a sentence or two, but it's hard to connect those pieces. Like we can infer a lot, but we don't have the direct info. So that's why I hope with these connections that we can draw more of people's lives and yeah, more full form. It's a good time to mention, I'm really happy to see that more people are descriptive in their obituaries. Yeah. Because I mean, if you're doing a family tree, I mean, it's great that the obituary is there, married to wife, but give some detail. Right. And I, I love writing obituaries because I like the, like I love, I love the fact that I get to document yes. what a person did. Yeah. I wish I could do an obituary on everybody in Sault Ste. <laughs> you know, I wish everybody could leave a mark. And yeah. Who was this person? What did they enjoy doing? Yeah. So yeah, if you're writing an obituary, give the detail. Give some color. Yeah. What the person like to do? Where did they live? Yep. But I can see your point that you got to make the connection. The connections. I think it's important in this world, the digital world that we live in too, right? Everyone feels like they're disconnected, but we have so much drawing us together. And yeah, it's interesting talking to people here and everyone seems to have such different lives, but we're all, we're all connected in so many different small ways. And you know, I'm the guy that brought in the manual typewriter and you're the <laughs> generation that's never seen one. It's always on computer. <laughs> yeah. But I've still used one, I've still touched one, <laughs> yes, <you have>. but <laughs> played a little, but yeah, I will never understand that completely. So being so connected to things that are happening in the Sioux on a daily basis, how does it translate? Do you feel like you have a greater connection with the city of Fair People I think because so. of your work? Well, yeah, because yeah. it's like, oh, I know there's so you many know. different groups that you follow, <laughs> you know, the Sioux Theater Workshop, Harry Houston. I'll go with conservative music. Oh, hi, guy. How are you? How's Susan? <laughs> that you, what's the expression? You're a mile wide and an inch deep. Deep. That right. you know something about a lot of different groups. Yeah. And which goes back to what I mentioned about Keith Stephen. I mean, you do the job for so many years. You go to so many assignments that you at least get, get to know the organizers. Right. So I have a greater, you know, that's a neat thing, to t I think, which ties on to your question. Yeah. It's just to have an appreciation yes. for all the different ways that people help do things to make, how do I phrase it? Yeah. All the different things people do to help out in the community, mm -hmm. whether it's community theater or fundraisers, you know, the Rotary Club and, and Rotary Fest. Yes. That's friggin' awesome. That's the highlight. That's one of my favorite assignments to shoot, the folks that do Bon Sue. You know, people are making the effort to make it happen. And yeah. I think you get an appreciation of that as a reporter because you see the commitment that's being made. Right. I love that. That's beautiful. Um, so you also do in other years, right? You do all those. I do. <laughs> um, I'm glad you raised it. You go ahead. <laughs> um, so first off, how do you stay connected to that history and what inspires you for each of these posts? What like sources do you use for research and all of that? So it's all newspapers.com. Our online archive, post media archive only goes back to 97. Anything in our archive for that? Well, our archive's now down at the library. Thank you, Sault Ste. Marie Public Library, for giving our archive a home, and they're taking such awesome care of it. Thank you, Sharon Wigney and her crew. But newspapers.com, uh -huh. it's right back to day one right. with the Sioux Star. So when I do another year's, I'm doing newspapers.com. And then for the day, I'm just basically looking what catches my eye. Mm -hmm. What catches my eye and what can I say in about 30 words? If it's something that was actually a good hard news story, but I say, how am I going to explain that in 30 words? Well, I'll, right. I'll let it be. Right. So I, I guess it could be, is there something major mm -hmm. that happened? Was there something strange that happened? Is there something where a bunch of people's names mm. are mentioned? Because mm -hmm. quite frankly, I want people to look at other years and say, that's my cousin. That's my uncle Fred. Yes. I didn't know he did that. I forgot he did that. See, I love that. Like, uh, the, do you know about this? The shipbuilding? We talked about this. Didn't we go on an email about this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Down at Bellevue Park. Yes. I had no idea about that. Yeah. That there was, a, I think, a British company, <laughs> uh -huh. and Clerg was 
involved in it somehow. Wanted to build, was it dry shipbuilding? Yes. They wanted to build ships at Bellevue Park. Yeah. And then the First World War happened. Yep. So that scotched that. Gone. <laughs> but can you imagine, it's like, what if there's no Bellevue Park and there is a shipyard? Sh shipyard, yeah, it'd be wild. So stuff like that is is neat. And and something else within other years is just the, all the groups. Yeah. Like, did the Sons of Italy, did the Sons of Italy become the Marconi Club? That's good I don't know. I don't know that one. And there's reference to the Oddfellows Hall, but yeah. it's not the Oddfellows Hall on Dennis Street. So where was it? Right. All the different uh, cultural groups. Well, I mentioned Sons of Italy, but there was, uh, there was a Scottish group that was around. And the different businesses. It's like, so I look for that too. It's like, I've never heard about this. And uh, again, to tie in with the names, uh, oh, I wish I remembered the group, Mira, I'm sorry. It was a group I'd never heard of. And the Sioux Star reported, I think it was 1914, there was 50 people at a house on Dufferin Street. You see the houses on Dufferin Street, they're not that big. It's like, <laughs> where do all those people go? But they all got there and had a shindig one night. <laughs> That's super cool. I love that. These are all super cool stories. Um, you kind of answered my la next question. Like, were there any stories that stumped you, left you surprised, leading to dead ends, maybe? So you kind of touched on those. I guess it can't be a dead end because it's it's just that day. Right. But I am curious, and sometimes I've looked ahead. This is yeah to see well, how this turn out. <laughs> yes, it's just a reminder of how little you know. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. it's like, again, I mean, I started reporting in 2000. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, well, we were writing stories for almost 100 years before that. Right. So quite often, I have no idea. No. <laughs> some things I have some, I had heard a little bit about, but the shipbuilding, I knew nothing right. about. Yeah. I wish I wish I could have some other examples because I'm sure there's some. I, I brought in other years about six, eight months ago. And right. I'm sure there's been things like, I had no friggin' clue. Yeah. This was just in the last week. It sounds like there was a guy maybe around the 50s or 60s. He was kind of a... It sounds like he could be in a circus. It was talking <laughs> about like acts of daring do. I said, I never heard of this guy. I think I might. There's a... Yeah. There's a... In our uh, lobby on the second floor, there's a touch screen and it has different characters. And there's a guy that did like extreme like the... Where are those? Had to escape. Yep. There. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the same character, but okay. again, I'd never, I'd never heard of him. Yeah. So it's like catnip for me because <laughs> yeah, so you exciting. get into it, it's like, oh, that, I had, oh, really? Yeah. Well, let me read some more. Yeah. And it's also interesting to read the different writing styles. I mean, the way you okay. wrote in 1914 is definitely different. And some of the terms mm -hmm. are, well, I mean, it's the evolution of language. Yeah. It's fun. It's... Uh, if you're a history buff, get a newspaper stuff. <laughs> I mean, I do it mostly for work. I've done some family stuff on it, too. Yeah. And, I, and I've learned things. I mean, I learned my mom was a flower girl at a wedding in 1936. She I had know. no memory. She had no memory then. Right. So, newspapers.com, because you had that much more coverage, and you may, you may be surprised what your relatives did. <laughs> Good or bad, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, right. Interesting. And all the theaters... There's so many theaters, like the Orphe Orpheum. The Orpheum, yes. Um, Made it to about 77. Heaven Can Wait. I did a podcast on it a, while, a year ago now. I can't remember all the names of all of them. But they were all, there was like a period of time, like in a 10-year span, you could walk like 10 steps and you would get to another theater. They were all so close to each other, all along Queen. And see, when I hear that, I think, so what did they do? Did you go for movies? Were they stage shows? Were they music? Did you dance? There is difference. There, there was, um, I want to say it was the Grand Theater, but I'm not, or the, no, it was at Orpheum. They had um, vaude, vaudeville shows with yeah. like the animals and live performance and stuff. So that's where it all started. And then it started evolving into like live shows and films. You talk about dead ends. Hank Williams was on Gore Street around 1947 or 1948. Okay. But all we had in our paper that I could find was an advertisement. I said, we didn't cover Hank Williams? 
I think at that point he would have had some hits. Right. Does anybody out there have any... Are there any photographs <laughs> of Hank Williams in Sault Ste. Marie? Right. I'd be fascinated. Yeah. Wouldn't it be neat if somebody had an autographed Hank Williams album from Sault Ste. Marie? Yeah. Does that building still stand? I'd like to check that out, too. Right. Okay. We kind of touched on this, but I'm going to take on it because we're going to transition to something else. Um, has technology affected your job? <laughs> I know it has. How so? Well, everything, I mean, the computer has, we were filing on computer to begin with, it's just that much more. I mean, I mean now with, with our connection with Barry, okay, we had the, the printing press till 2014. Okay. Now, you, and then you would, you would, you as the editor would do all the layout mm -hmm. on your computer at the Sioux Star building. Okay. Now, when I'm doing layout, I say, here are the stories I want on this page. I send a note down to Barry. Barry puts together the page. They send it back to me for approval. So, I mean, that's, that's changed. Definitely. From uh, before. I mean, we, we went from film, right? The first couple of years are still shooting from yeah. film. Now everything's digital. So that was another change. I should be really thinking of a bunch of other examples. <laughs> I mean, again, it ties into, I can buy myself some time again by saying, well, okay, with the social media. Now we're, I well, mean, yeah. when I started, I mean, you were, you were just writing, I can't remember when we or the website started, but you were essentially writing for the paper. For the paper, yeah. And, well, we definitely, I think it was four news stories a day. That's all we post. That's my memory. Right. It, it was limited. Right. Whereas now, it's you write it, you post it. And the photo galleries. Yeah. Uh, for a while, we had on Monday's paper, there'd be a, a photo page at the back. Like, if there was Rotary, a big community event like that. Whereas now, it's... It's much more regular, and yeah. I mean, you could. Well, I might cap out at twenty or twenty-five, but right. I, even that's going to be more than what you get in the paper because yes. you might get six, eight shots without yeah. them becoming microscopic. Yep. Yeah. No, that's great. That's that answers the question. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the computer. It, oh, this should be coming so quickly to me, but I'm, I'm struggling. <laughs> Um, and of course, well, and then we're working <laughs> remotely, right? I mean, before, yeah. I thought, I thought, news, how can you have reporters no. working at home? That can never happen. Well, it did happen, yeah. and we're all working at home. So is there and any collaboration computer. while you're working remote with other well, I, reporters? I guess, well, I mean, some. Yeah. You would go, I mean, that was the nice thing about being in the newsroom, right? Exactly. It's like, it's like I had Linda Richardson next to me. I mean, Linda started reporting late '60s, so even though I could ask her, "Yeah, look, I'm working on this. Oh, here's a name." So I mean, that was right. You can still do that via email, but the other person is doing a half hour interview. They might not be checking their email to get Definitely. back. Definitely. But yeah, so now everybody's got a laptop. They're at home, and that's yeah. It's not as conducive because again. You get that brainstorming going on when you're when you got four or five reports. You've got an editor. When we had editors, yeah. of course, editors are editors because they've got that much more experience. They can give you some guidance. Yeah, you're missing that right. with the current environment. Right, right. So, are all the records from your library? They're all digital now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what I can answer, because again, everything, any, everything from '97 goes to our archive. Yep. So if I want to show, oh, I need to do a story, story on Sault Ste. Marie Museum. What have I done lately? What's in today's paper is already on the archive. Yes. It's, it, it's instantaneous. Right. Which is crucial for us because, yeah. pardon me, sometimes if it's something you're writing about on a regular basis, you're usually pretty sharp on what's happening, but sometimes right. you do have to go back. And it's mm -hmm. great to have the archive there that can make it happen. Yeah. You can bone up on it and off you go. As we advance into the digital world, what made you lean towards typewriters and an avid collector of manual I, technology instead of... I, I mean, again, it probably, I think it goes back again to being 
uh, a youngster mm -hmm. and my dad having an old Underwood, which was probably from the 1920s, which I could use. Yeah. So that was pretty neat. So I, I figured that was going to be a question. And it's like, oh, <laughs> boy, I just was drawn to it. And yeah. Maybe was it an adult thing to do? Did I just like that? I mean, even now to, I mean that, I find that soothing. Yes. I get a kick out of it. So there were always typewriters in the house, and I always liked to type. I was lousy at sports. I was terrible in math and science, but I could write. And to write, well, part of it would be using a typewriter. So I guess it would be like a tool to trade. Right. So were you writing your beginner stories at home on? Yes. And having said that, I would. <laughs> no way. Way. <laughs> <laughs> Having made that plug for typewriters, I'm not going to tell you. I would sit down with my three-ring binder paper, and I, I wish I had the skill. I mean, I, I'm 99% sure that what you see here was just me just writing. writing. Like, I don't think there was any rough drafts. It was just this. I would just <laughs> right. sit down and... Wow, and you never went back to like... I would have marked it up. This is so crazy. This is awesome that you kept this. If I could grab one thing out of the house before it burned down, I think it would be this binder because it's where it all started. That's so amazing. And But look at the last page. But these are long chapters. There's chapter two, chapter three. And again, I was you know probably from the library books. And... The little drawing. So yes, so I think it was from the Hardy Boys. And then, sorry, there's the pause. Maybe you didn't read Hardy Boys. But, but, Maybe you do. Anyways, the Hardy <laughs> Boys, you would have, well, I guess in the Chronicles of Narnia, right? You'd have, okay. the, you'd have the illustrations. So I think it was that example that said, okay, I'm, and Mike, I couldn't draw, but Mike Joy, my childhood chum, he was my artist. So I would write the story, I'd leave the spaces, as you see, Michael would put in the artwork. No way. That's so cool that you were even collaborating on artistic projects, even at such a young age. But if you read the story, I would ask you... To, to sign it. This is amazing. And you have a binder full of them. How many do you think you wrote in grade six? Oh, I have to go through. You know, that, <laughs> it is a good question, though, is how many did I do? It's a binder, it? yeah. Like, I think this is everything. But that's great. Well, the grade three story isn't here. This is grade three to grade, but there's not a whole lot. I mean, there might be ten here. That's so crazy. Definitely more than enough to so you've been documenting, you've kept care of, take care of these, been documenting, collecting for your entire life. Life on Mars. <laughs> like, where did you think you got inspiration for all of these? Okay. <laughs> Yay. <Yeah, yeah. laughs> so my mom started family history books around 1966. Okay. Wow. I mean, we're... It's not, you're not going to, it's not riveting reading, but if you want to know what, when you went to the dentist, if somebody was sick, who got married, who died, That's... mom did that till about 2014. So cool. that was one example. So cool. And then my dad, <laughs> if you ask my dad, Roger, September 14th, 1990, what time did you get up? He would pull out his 1990 book because he, he kept little squares for each day. And wow. he could tell you what time you got up. He could tell you what the weather was like. So you've got all this data from, from my mom and dad. Yes. So I'm thinking that would explain why you're now looking at this binder of stories from St. Bernadette. Definitely. And very aligns with your career. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I love data. <laughs> this is incredible. That is such a great thing to collect and have. Do you do this personally for yourself? No, and this is the thing: is that every year on my calendar, well, in a well, in a way, but not as not like my mom. Right. I've got day planners. Okay. For each year. Okay. Where I will write stuff down, but my mom, she would take the calendar in the kitchen yep. down, and then here she would write down the important stuff from the month. So yeah, you no, know, she, mom and dad were much more thorough about that. I mean, I've got. I didn't bring that one, but I have notebooks that I've kept for at least 25 years that I could probably figure it out, but this is more efficient than what right. I've got. Right. And what about your journalistic journals? Do you keep all of those? 
you know, we're supposed to keep them for, I think it was five years. Okay. Which I do, <laughs> but that's, that's a lot of notepads. I can imagine. Uh, like, how often do you go through one like that? Not enough. <laughs> when the when the office closed, there was this, an empty office behind me, and that's where I kept my note. Okay. I'm sure they went back at least ten years. Wow. But I mean, that's more for post media to come and take care of, as opposed to it's my responsibility now. Right. Yeah, I keep that, and you will look back. Definitely, I would go back because sometimes a story would come. It's like. I want to reach this person. I should have their number in my notebook. Hmm. Or sometimes, for some reason, you want to go back. That's why <laughs> this is a new notepad, so I don't have it. But on the front, yep. I will have the start date and the end date. Okay. And then that'll help me definitely track it down. And if I have to check a fact, it's there. Last question. 100 years from now, the museum has an exhibit on you, three artifacts that would be on display, and the title of your exhibit would be? I'm gonna waffle on that question <laughs> and answer it this way. Okay. A hundred years from now, if somebody could pull up a story that I wrote mm -hmm. and it helps them understand something, my work's been done. I remember once, Somebody died, maybe an organist, tied in with St. Luke's Cathedral. Okay. And we had a file on that person. There was literally one clipping in that file, and it right. gave me information that helped me write an obituary. Yep. So if something that I photographed or a story that I've done can be used that way in 2124, awesome. I'll, I'll be. So happy. That's beautiful. That's happened. Because there's been so many reporters, when I go through the archive, and I mean, it's, it's on a regular basis, how many reporters have been with the Sioux Star since day one who've written stories that help me understand right. something that happened? So it's a way to pay it forward. I love that. Typewriter would be nice, yep. I guess, in the display. Yep. And then I assume. That binder right there. Oh, uh, that's a good. <laughs> that's a good point. The detective stories from Saint Bernadette. That's a pretty. Uh, yeah. That's for the box set, though. I guess for it has to be something work related, but it's it's a building block. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. And then title. Well, know your history is what I always preach. So. <laughs> Perfect. And it fits in with what your mandate is. Too. Definitely. There's so many incredible stories that it's really worth the effort to yep. poke around and learn about your family, learn about your street, learn about your workplace. Yeah. What's, Fascinating. What's a piece of advice for people of Sault Ste. Marie to get connected to their history or... So, start at home. Yep. Like what you've done by interviewing your grandfather. Yep. I mean, it's the more that you can do, the earlier that you have the conversation. Yep. Do it. You'll be grateful. Your grandkids will be grateful. Yep. To have images, to have the voice recorded. I guess the tricky thing is, you know, VHS tapes. Okay, well, so that's the challenge is how do you record something that, 50, 75 years, it can still be viewed. Right, right. That's the challenge. Yeah. The nice thing about print is, I guess print, in a sense, is the safest yeah. to last because you can read a document now, you can read it 75 years from now. Yeah. But boy, if you can figure out a way for the images, the voice, that's even better. Oh, I shouldn't say that. I'm a print guy. But... <laughs> You're going to have, I think, most of the information in print, but to have there, wow, that's my great grandfather right there. Fantastic. Yeah. And give detail in obituaries, because I always think if you're, I always think, you know, you say 100 years. Yep. 
you're if you're researching a family member a hundred years from now, they're, they're going to depend probably largely on your obituary right. to get some sense. So it's, it's not a it's not a pleasant thing to do. No. But give some detail. Definitely. About your loved one. Definitely. So it's not just a name and a year of birth and a year of death. Yep. Give some context. Yeah. It's a good way to honor them as well and keep the legacy, I would say. Yes. Right? Yeah. So you asked what to do. Start at, yeah, start at the home and yeah. what you can do to preserve your own family history. That's why it's neat to see when the library, when you guys have your nights about preserving photographs and preserving documents. What a wonderful opportunity. To Definitely. We're hopefully doing one too for Archives Week um, in April, I believe. Um, doing a dedicated course and program on preserving family history because it is so important. And especially once they come here, we want to make sure that they people think of us and have it properly preserved and documented so that we can keep collecting and preserving it in a good way with the full story intact as well. And it's that kind of course that I look at and go, oh yeah, I need, I need to do that. Yeah. Because then my challenge as the tape continues to roll is I'm pretty much going to be the last member of our family in Sault Ste. Marie. Mm. So what's the best thing for me to do to document, well, my mom's family came here around 1905, so there's 120 years. What's the best way, what can I do to leave for my nieces and nephews that they get a sense of the family's time in the suit? Right. It's important. It's beautiful. Yeah, I feel bad that it's like Sault Ste. Marie well, it was part of the family history. My dad was from Montreal. Yeah. I'd love to go there and visit the family graves. My brother went during the pandemic. And, That's cool. You know, all those people you forget about. But yeah. Without them, there's no you. So It's very true. It's very true. The effort. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you feel like you want to bring up? Or no? <laughs> read a newspaper <laughs> step away from the computer take 15 or 20 minutes yep. nice thing about a newspaper well there's a lot of nice things about a newspaper but you don't go down rabbit holes No. Nope. like you do on the computer yep. and I say that as a newspaper guy who goes down rabbit holes when I go on the computer oh, I'll refresh Twitter oh wow another 15 minutes went by you know, just take 15, 20 minutes, read a paper, you'll get boned up on what's happening in your community, your country, the world. Definitely. Read some op-ed pieces and then go about your day. Yeah. Have a nice cup of coffee, whatever your favorite <laughs> beverage is, and you've got news from reputable sources. Yes. Definitely. There's the plug. <laughs> There's the plug. Need the plug. <laughs> awesome. So, thank you. <laughs> Mira, thank you. I was really excited to come down and chat. Yes, this was great. I am so honored to see all your old history documented of all your stories and capture your story here. It'll be in the cap in the museum's collection for years to come. So your story is documented and safe with that. Cool. That's about the neatest thing you could have. <laughs> right? Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Mira. You never say your name. <laughs> <laughs> the My? podcast I've listened to, I never hear you say, I'm Mira. <laughs> well, it's pronounced Mari. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Hi, I'm JL Fazell, and I write and publish poetry inspired by nature and the art of being human. These are some of my words. If you live in Northern Ontario, or have been here, then you know that spring up here can be a bit of a mess. So the poem I'm about to read for you is called Spring, and it's from my fourth book, Human Nature. Where I come from, spring is a bit of a mess, and a little unpredictable, until she's steady, and life begins again. But at her worst, she's still hope incarnate. I hope this poem took you somewhere inside yourself that you needed to go. You can listen to my story here on the Stories of Northern Life podcast. 
Links are in the show notes. Did you know you can get unlimited admission to the Sault Ste. Marie Museum for a whole year for just $15? Yep, that's right. And there's more perks to that too. Go to Sioux Museum, that's S-A-U-L-T, museum.ca, under visit and learn more about our membership options. And if you're a business, corporate or nonprofit, we have plans for you too. Reach out to us by emailing info at with any inquiries.